are so sorry about that. We had a few technological issues. We're so grateful for your patience. Hope you had a nice little coffee break there in between. And we'll go back to the band. Hit it, guys. like a river wash over me immerse me in water as deep as the sea hide me in love your healing embrace peace like a river Wash over me as I worship your majesty. I worship your holy name, Jesus, my everything. All that I am is yours. Lord, 
send it now the move of your spirit heaven break out come now with power cover this land like you've done it before would you do it again I hold most dear to me For those I call my family How could you love them more than me? Somehow you do All these prayers I'm scared to pray All these things I want to say All the times I'm in the way Forgive me trust you, God. Let it be your heart. Let it be your word. This weight that I've been carrying, I know it's never meant for me. Remind once again, it's in your hands. Let it be Jesus. For all the days to love ahead, lead me from my selfishness to live in love. Again, it's in your hands. 
Good morning again. Isn't it great how sometimes things just don't work out? And uh, today was one of those days, but you know what? The Word of God and the message and the worship is still just as true, and uh, we are just thankful for you uh, being here today. One thing you could do as a favor for me, it's not too late, is you can take your device and just click on the word share and then write a post and then share or whatever it is that you need to do. I would really encourage you to share this with as many people as possible. Uh, the YouTubers uh, aren't on right now because YouTube won't allow us to restart a broadcast for 24 hours for some reason. At least that's what the message is on the screen. So if you could share that with people, uh, maybe at least a lot of people could get connected who were otherwise on YouTube, slide over to Facebook. So anyway, we're glad you're here. And this Great Reset series is all about us rethinking renewal to recognize revival. And I was thinking about that, and actually the reverse is just as true. We need to rethink revival so that we can recognize renewal. And both of those aspects are true. Last week we spent time discussing the differences between renewal and revival and spiritual awakening, and we issued you a challenge, and the challenge was for you to research some prominent revivals of the day, like the Azusa Street Revival or uh, the uh, Asbury Revival or whatever, all those, some of those great revivals of the past, and to look at some of the things that were surrounding that. And I hope that you took that challenge. Today's challenge is kind of an interesting challenge too, I think at least. We're headed to two places um, for the main session. One is Psalm 119, the other is Nehemiah chapter 8. If you want to put your finger um, on both of those, they're really kind of pretty close together in the Word. But Psalm 119, many attribute that to King David, and others attribute it to the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. <clears throat> and the reality is, either way, there's some fantastic things in that book. But it's kind of neat to think that possibly this uh, psalm was written by someone in the era of Nehemiah, which we're going to be talking about in a moment. The neat thing about Psalm 119 is it's an acrostic poem. It's, uh, it's a, a poem, uh, not an acrostic, but anyway, it's a poem that has the same letters that start each section. There are 22 sections in the psalm, and each psalm, each section represents a Hebrew letter, and the, each phrase in that section starts with the same Hebrew letter. And each of those verses, except for five, I'll tell you that ahead of time so you know at least part of the challenge, five of the 176 verses don't have some word for God's word either precept, commandment, statutes, law, word, testimonies. There are about eight different words uh, that the psalmist uses. And my challenge for you today, even though the word for word, several words, are listed or used 178 times in 176 verses, there are five verses that don't have that. So I issued you a challenge. Here it is. The first person that texts me or emails me or whatever, um, the five, accurately, the five verses that don't have some word for God's word in Psalm 119, I'll give you a $10 Starbucks card, or $10 card to the coffee beverage company of your choice. So, here we go, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is, is the 
psalm that is really truly recognized as a psalm about the Word of God and the passion and the love for the Word of God. We're not going to be here long because we're headed to Nehemiah to get the real story about the Word of God. But listen to some of the words that the psalmist uses. In verses 47 and 48, the psalmist says this, I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out to your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Do you hear the passion in that? Or verse 97, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Verse 167, I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. Verse 159, see how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. Psalm 119 verse 93 says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them I have, you have preserved my life. And then a couple that are much more familiar to you. Verse 11 of Psalm 119, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And verse 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. There's no doubt that the psalmist loves the Word of God and recognizes that the Word of God is preserving, life-preserving, guiding, and has for us something to do with this renewal of our soul. In Nehemiah, we have a wonderful story. Head to Nehemiah 8 while I'm kind of just giving you a bit of an intro. Nehemiah is a beautiful story. The people of Israel were in... in uh, they were kept in captivity, and, and they were, the city had been kind of ransacked. There were people that were sort of still there, and the walls were destroyed. People's houses were destroyed, and Nehemiah got this passion for rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And so he kind of asked the captive king, can I go back and just rebuild the wall? And anyway, he was given permission to go back. And this sermon isn't about the leadership principles in Nehemiah, and there are tons of leadership principles. But instead, I want to hone in just on this chapter 8. And in this chapter 8, part, they were in the process of this rebuilding or wherever they were. And in chapter 8, Ezra begins to proclaim the word of God. And I would just read to you a bit of this. This is what it says in verse 1, all the people, chapter 8, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Here we have this guy reading God's word, reading the law, and all the people who could understand listening attentively. What a great gift for a preacher to be listened to attentively. And as Ezra was reading, something else was happening. But the first thing that we need to understand is that this was a word for all. This was a word, this word of encouragement, this word of passion, this word of whatever it is that each one of those people got out of this. It was for everybody. They gathered this assembly and they read the word of God. But not only was it a word for everyone, there is a response and a posture to hearing the Word of God. Every one of us. Now, we could hear the Word of God and not respond and not have any kind of posture at all. We could hear it and just completely ignore it. But that's not what happened here. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, here's what we read. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that standing up, then raising your hands, then bowing down with your face to the ground is a necessary style of worship every time you come before God. But what I am saying is that these people, as they heard the word of God, it impacted them. It changed their position. They were sitting there. They were listening, and then they stood up 
when the word of God was opened, they raised their hands in praise because of what they were hearing. And in great, a great sense of humility and potentially even mourning, as we're going to hear in a bit, they laid their faces down before God and humbled themselves. And can we at least commit to the idea that the Word of God, as we read this Word, not just the law, but the entire Word of God that we have, could it incite from within us a great sense of respect? This is not just Shakespearean poetry. This is not just some kind of wonderful prose. This is the living Word of God. And as we read it and as we hear it, it should elicit from us a reaction of reverence and respect. It should ask from us a response of praise and worship. And yes, it should ask from us a humility, a posturing before God that positions us in submission, not just to this word, but to the living God who inspired and wrote it. One of the things I love about this this description in, in Nehemiah 8 is they didn't just say the word of God. They didn't just stand there and read it. But in fact, Ezra began to preach and the Levites began to preach. And if we look at verses 7 and 8, we read this. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. And so the Levites, those in charge of understanding and knowing the law, didn't just have it read, but they actually explained, this is what it means. And I love the fact that today, we have a few avenues for that. Now, we have people, for certain. We have preachers like me that are, that are expressing the Word of God to you. There are others online or other wonderful churches around our city and around our world. And there's also something called the Holy Spirit which I believe speaks to us and declares the word of God to us in clarity. And I love the fact that God has a passion to have his word be made clear. You see, I don't believe for a moment that God wrote the word of God to confuse us, to make us so twisted in our mind that we have absolutely no idea what he means. And I'll give you a little bit of plug. We're going to be preaching uh, from the book of Revelation in the spring. Talk about a confusing book. But also talk about the passion that God has for us to understand him. And when we get to that book, I truly believe that we can understand what he's talking about. These people heard the word of God. They heard it expounded upon. They understood. And here's what happens when we understand the word of God. When we understand the Word of God, something happens within us in that humility posture where I become aware of my sin. Not just that I know in general that that I'm a human and therefore I'm, I'm sinful or was born into sin. Not that sense, but in a specific to me sense. As I read the Word of God, as I hear the Word of God being read, it challenges my soul to understand where I line up and where I don't line up to the Word of God. And one of the great responses that I have is a response of mourning, a a response of not just guilt, but actually true sense of this is not right within me and I need to do something about it. In verses 9 through 12, we have this wonderful, wonderful section where they're actually asked to stop mourning And I think that's because within our sense of understanding and humility about our own grief and our own guilt, there is also grace. And there is also forgiveness and there is also an excitement because not only do I feel bad about my sin or or, or feel as though I'm not lined up with God, when I read the Word of God and I allow it to read me, what happens is God's grace pours into me and I can also turn from mourning to dancing, to rejoicing. So listen to the words, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. 
Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Notice, in the midst of this, my rejoicing that comes from the understanding of God's word and his encouragement to me also creates within me a sense of generosity. Don't just celebrate within yourselves, also provide for others. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You might have heard that statement before. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Here it is, nestled in the context of Nehemiah, turning mourning to dancing. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And then all the people went away to eat and to drink and to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. See, that's what happens when we understand God's word. We don't just understand that we're sinful. That's a part of it. But the Bible is not written just so that we can feel bad about ourselves. The Bible is not written the story of the Messiah and the story of the coming Christ child and the story of his death and his resurrection to pay for our sins is not just a story so that we feel terrible. It is a story so that we acknowledge our sin, but that we come to God for forgiveness. And yes, there is a period of mourning, but that mourning should turn quickly to dancing. It should turn quickly to celebration. And of course, when we understand that, what really happens is that we want more of it, right? I want more grace. I don't need to be browbeat more and more. I don't need to be told how terrible I am over and over and over again. Yes, I admit. Yes, I recognize my sin. Yes, the scriptures are clear where I deviate from God's will for my life. But it is also clear that Jesus died on the cross to provide payment for my sin so that I don't have to pay it myself, so that there is grace, that the offering has already been made for my guilt. And then the word of God brings joy and brings rejoicing, brings worship, brings praise, and I can't get enough of that. Listen to what it says. On the second day of the month, The heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. So the whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Now think about that. Obviously, God is proclaiming to them that not everything is permanent. God is proclaiming to them, remember when you were nomads, remember when you were, let me tell you, as they built these temporary shelters, the proclamation just to understand who was really in control and where their life really came from. Day after day. Can you imagine coming together seven days a week, hearing the word of God being proclaimed over and over and over and on the eighth day? there was an assembly. I kind of almost think that maybe it should be translated. And on the eighth day, there was a big party. On the eighth day, they came together because they understood that the word of God brought life. They understood that the word of God was not just condemning, but within the word of God came grace. And that carries on into the New Testament so seamlessly. Because we believe that we are an Old Testament and a New Testament. Christianity is is a culmination of both of those things. We are grafted into the vine of Israel, and we are a Judeo-Christian community. And what is true in the Old Testament is true in the New Testament as it slides through history. And this is what John says in 1 John 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, remember the beginning, way back there in the Old Testament times? 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Did you get that? Did you get that tactile touch thing? Now, before the word of God, it was a written word. It was an oral word. It was not just an ideology. It was beyond just that. But it wasn't as tangible as a person. And Jesus Christ came as the word of God. The word made flesh. The incarnation. Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus is called the word with a capital W because he is the culmination of all that God would proclaim to you. The Word, you can touch Him, you can hear Him, you can worship Him, you can see Him. He is a tangible life giver. And they proclaim that concerning the Word of life. In Philippians chapter 2, we read this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And many of us could handle reading that verse over and over again. And I would also be one who would say, Lord, help the word of God change me. That I'm not negative all the time. That I don't grumble and complain and argue. That I would be marked as one who is different. But before I get too carried away on that, listen to what it says in context. Do everything without arguing or grumbling so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then, listen to this, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. There it is again, the word of life. You see this living word of God, Jesus himself, the Logos, the word proclaims to you and me freedom and life and a transformed and changed life. Could I say a renewal? As we challenge you in a few weeks to spend 21 days in prayer and fasting, however you choose to do so, whether it's fasting a meal a day, a meal a week, whether it's fasting from choice foods, there's going to be some resources online for you to look at. We want you to experience this series, not just hear it. Did you notice in Nehemiah 8, they didn't just hear the word of God, they experienced it. They stood, they worshiped, they raised their hands, they fell prostrate, prostrate, <coughs> prostrate before the Lord. Sorry. They humbled themselves. They mourned. They rejoiced. They made a difference in who they were. And in these 21 days, my passion, my prayer is that God would do something in me. That he would work in me, that he would change me. John chapter 6, verses 66 to 68. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Because Jesus had just said some pretty tough words about following tough words about what it really meant and he confused them I think in a way that because they were just some of them not open to really understanding what he said and many of the disciples turned back and Jesus looked at his his, his group this, this group of, of 12 and he said you do not want to leave too do you Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Why? Because you have the words of eternal life. Did you see that? In the midst of tough words, in the midst of, of, of confusion for some, Peter says, Jesus, I'm not going anywhere because I see within you the words of eternal life. I see that you are the embodiment of all of who God is. And the question for each one of you, me, all of us is, how do we handle that? How do we handle that statement? To whom will you go? 
Do you see Jesus as the true source of eternal life? Do you have an assurance within you? This blessed assurance that Jesus is all that you need? Can I pray for you and for me that during this series, we will not just gain understanding, we will not just hear words, but we will allow God to do a work in us so that we can recognize him even more clearly for who he really is. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for your word. I thank you that you're calling us to be a people who understand and get into and have your word get into us. Help us, God, not just to be consumers of information. Help us not to just suck in all the facts, but help us to really be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, blessed assurance. I know for a fact that you died for my sins. I know for a fact that you offer me grace. I know for a fact that when I say to you, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life, that you will. And praise you, Jesus, even now. For those who might be just praying that prayer. For those who say, look, I want this renewal thing. I want this excitement that he's talking about. I want to know Jesus and have him know me. Praise you, Jesus, for the fact that you are everlasting life. And in you, I find all that I need. Good. 
Can I get an amen? I've just always wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here at Journey today. Even with all of our imperfections, we are just so blessed to have you. Now, if you are feeling inspired to give it all, you can do this by e-transfer or by visiting our website at journeyonline.ca slash give. We hope you have a wonderful Sunday, a wonderful week, and we can't wait to see you in person or virtually, maybe, who knows, uh, next week. See you then. <laughs>